thank you for inviting me. A lot of times when we think about student empowerment, the importance of giving students a larger voice comes up. Maybe allowing them to take up a classroom role or have a say in the activities in which students participate. Even if you Google the term, I Googled it, it says an activity or process that enables students to make decisions and implement changes in their own schools. Pretty fair. But I thought there's a second part to this word that's equally important. So here's my definition. Student empowerment not only allows students to make changes in the classroom for others, but allows them to take charge of their own learning. It encourages them to try new activities and subjects without fearing failure or restriction. But most importantly, student empowerment fosters achievement, and more specifically, achievement that lasts. First up, let's talk Legos. And no, I didn't make that, I'm not that good. But I do wanna, I do wanna talk about a Lego competition I did earlier this year. For this competition, we created a large Lego robot and programmed it to accomplish a wide variety of tasks for points. Now, while the programming and testing of this robot was a core component of the competition, there was a section within it requiring us to research a real world issue pertaining to the competition's theme, which this past year was uh, how humans consume and utilize water. So our team compiled research, we put it all together on this big poster board, and we brought it with us to the competition. But the most important part of this entire process, and the part that appealed to me the most, was the fact that we were required to share our research with other organizations. In our case, we reached out to government institutions, several companies, and private researchers just to get their insights and their thoughts on how an idea crafted by middle schoolers could possibly work in practice. And I felt as though just having that opportunity to put our thought process and ideas out there was very fulfilling. Another example of a similar scenario was a history project I completed earlier this year. It was for a longer unit about Native American affairs in the early days of the United States and we had to write an informational paper on it. Fortunately, I'm not too bad at writing myself, so I sat down and in a couple of hours, I finished the paper. Now that may seem like your average history project, but we did something a few weeks later that really caught my attention. By this time we were studying the Civil War in a much smaller unit, but we still had to do an informational piece. However, this time we were asked to format our research into a public website, which we could share for others to reference. Now, going into this project, I felt the exact same way. I sat down, I procrastinated for a little while, that's important, <laughs> and then I wrote up the project. But in the end, when it was all said and done, I was a lot happier with my website project, and I definitely retained a lot more information from the Civil War unit than I did from that generic paper on Native American affairs. Now, both topics are very, very interesting, and one isn't more important to the, than the other. But I was able to remember so much from that slightly diversified approach taken towards the Civil War website. So what does this, all of this mean? Why did I choose to share this with you? Well, I did because both of these stories involved small, detailed changes to curricula that diversified learning, and like I said, let me take charge of my education. In elementary school, uh, our teachers encouraged us to take it a step further, as they would have us share our learning online with augmented reality. So now with a scan of your work, one could unlock all of your incredible insights and knowledge into a topic that no one else knew about, but you were even more proud to share. Once again, this almost seamless integration of a diversified approach into everyday schoolwork radically changed the atmosphere for the better and made learning a lot more fun. Now, another thing we did in elementary school is we were allowed to fly drones in our technology class. Now, our teacher had taken all the necessary precautions surrounding flying objects in a classroom, <laughs> but I still managed to fly one into my leg because, yeah. <laughs> now, the moment after it flew into me, it hurt, and I failed that day, no doubt about it. But the very next day, when we came back to school, I picked up another drone and began flying it around as if I'd never crashed the first one. Now, think of this. If I was flying a drone for a professional company, and I crashed one into my leg, I'm not sure I'd be able to pick one up the second time like I did in my technology class. Now, obviously, if you're flying drones for a professional company, one would expect that you're sufficiently trained to do so. But there are no such expectations in a school. In a school, there's only a willingness to fail by both the students and the teachers. And this willingness cannot be captured in a better sense than those diversified approaches I was talking about earlier. The fact of the matter is that giving students the chances they need to fail will almost certainly result in failure. But knowing the energy in us students, we're not gonna stop there. 
we're gonna keep trying and trying until we're satisfied and until we succeed. We had another awesome program at my elementary school involving spheros, which are essentially small spherical robots that rotate themselves to move. You can see them on the screen there. Now with these robots, we would design an exoskeleton out of plastic to encase them and protect a balloon mounted on top of them as it drove through an enclosed space. Now the whole goal of this activity was to use a needle uh, placed on the front of the exoskeleton to pop as many of the other balloons in the arena. But in order to get to this competitive stage, we needed to create an exoskeleton that would work consistently. So several fourth and fifth graders got to work and within a couple of months, we had 3D printed a working Spiro exoskeleton. Now, each week the newest variant of the design would be pinned to the board in our technology room and I remember walking in there every week and thinking, wow, I can't believe we made this. With the failure of each prototype, we only got better and it wasn't long before we perfected the design. But the best part is when we fail, it doesn't have to be failing with 3D printed exoskeletons or large expensive drones. Student opportunities can be something as simple as asking a student to extend upon research or review the work of others. Really, as long as there are opportunities for us students to take advantage of, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem, the possibilities are endless. But on a slightly different note, there will probably come a time when all of us will be locked in doing the same set of activities and the possibilities may not seem so endless. That's of course when we start working. Oftentimes I hear the term real world tossed around to represent the working world and I really don't understand why that's done. I mean, first of all, school is real. As much as I'd like to think it's all a dream or something, it's not, it's real. But secondly, school is just as important as the working world and the key skills needed to lead a successful working life can be captured in an elementary school curriculum. For instance, one of my fifth grade teacher's main class activities were these grammar and language function videos that one member of the class would make each week. Now this was the alternative to reading out of a workbook, which obviously no one wants to do. Who's gonna read out of a workbook? And you may have caught on to the pattern by now, but the slightly diversified approach to the same content gave the creators of the video a chance to share out their learning, while the rest of the class could get the information they needed by watching a peer. Not only is that remarkable because it's an awesome way to maximize student learning, but it also encourages many of the traits needed in the working world. Having the skills of presenting, collaborating, speaking, and giving feedback are nothing short of essential to the job that so many of us will end up working. And it's just as essential that we instill such ideas into students at a young age. For me personally, small changes to uh, elementary school activities have made a large difference in our school, in my classmates, and continue to influence the ways in which I interact and work with others. But in order to attain this level of change, it's not necessary for teachers and principals to drastically change their pedagogies. It really is those small changes that count, and it really is the small changes that can give every student enduring opportunities. I'd like to conclude today with a fantastic quote by a poet and orator named G.K. Chesterton. He once said that education is simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to another. Now I thought this quote was especially fascinating because I interpreted it in two different ways. Firstly, I thought that the soul of a society was something that could be dictated. The exact same ideas would be passed down from generation to generation and they would follow this very strict, rigid path. But I think a more relevant application of these words is the interpretation through my mind, the mind of a seventh grader. To me, these words mean that the soul of a society is an ever-changing thing influenced by all of the fresh and exciting ideas presented in education. They remind me that I'm free to pursue my dream of becoming an aeronautical engineer and drive me to pursue this dream each and every day. So whenever I think of education in this sense, an interesting analogy comes to mind. If all of the standardized tests we take and papers we write lay a groundwork or a runway for me as a student, it really is those small yet important opportunities that can allow me and so many other students to take off. So principals, how can you help me find achievement that lasts? Thank you.